Hi guys, Dane here, and today I'm going to be making a start at the very least on my review of One Summer, American 1927 by Bill Bryson. So this is a chunky old uh, non-fiction book. I'm going to read you the blurb, then I'm going to go through and check out my tabs, and then I'll share my overall thoughts and rating at the end. So, Dane reads... In the summer of 1927, America had a booming stock market, a president who worked just four hours a day and slept much of the rest of the time, a semi-crazed sculptor with a mad plan to carve four giant heads into an inaccessible mountain called Rushmore, a devastating flood of the Mississippi, a sensational murder trial and a youthful aviator named Charles Lindbergh who started the summer wholly unknown and finished it as the most famous man on earth, so famous that Minnesota considered renaming itself after him. It was a summer that saw the birth of talking pictures, the invention of television, the peak of Al Capone reign of terror, the horrifying bombing of a school in Michigan by a madman, the ill-conceived decision that led to the Great Depression, the thrillingly improbable return to greatness of a wheezing over-the-hill baseball player named Babe Ruth, and an almost impossible amount more. In this hugely entertaining book, Bill Bryson spins a story of brawling adventure, reckless optimism and delirious energy. With the trademark brio wit and authority that have made him Britain's favourite writer of narrative non-fiction, he rolls out an unforgettable cast of vivid and eccentric personalities to bring to life a forgotten summer when America came of age, took centre stage and changed the world forever. So let's get some tabs. So we learn about some pilots that set a record of 51 hours in air. And, and they uh, landed pretty much deliriously thirsty because one of their uh, ground crew had left their canteens filled with soapy water and so they had nothing to drink. And we learn about the development of bombs during the First World War. In the early days, bombs were often nothing more than wine bottles filled with petrol or kerosene, with a simple detonator attached. There were a few pilots who hand grenades, and some for a time dropped specially made darts called flechettes, which could pierce a helmet or otherwise bring pain and consternation to those in the trenches below. As always, where killing is involved, technological process was swift, and by 1918, aerial bombs of up to 2,200 pounds were being dropped. Germany alone rained down a million individual bombs, some 27,000 tons of explosives, in the course of the war. Bombing was not terribly accurate. A bomb dropped from 10,000 feet rarely hit its target and often missed by half a mile or more. But the psychological effect, wherever a large bomb fell, was considerable. And we learn about a guy called Nungesa who uh, got injured a lot. No one in the war was injured more, or at least got up again afterwards. Nungesa had so many injuries that after the war he listed them all on his business card. They included six jaw fractures, four upper, two lower, fractured skull and palate, bullet wounds to mouth and ear, dislocations of wrist, clavicle, ankle and knees, loss of teeth, shrapnel wound to upper body, multiple concussions, multiple leg fractures, multiple internal injuries, and contusions too numerous to list. He was also gravely injured in a car crash in which a companion died. Often he was so banged up that he had to be carried to his plane by crew members and gently inserted into the cockpit. Just despite his injuries, Nungesa shot down 44 planes, he claimed many more. A number exceeded among French aviators only by René Fonck, and received so many medals that he all but clanked when he walked. He listed those on his business card too. Must have been a big ass business card. And ahead of one of the flights, um, Nungesa, uh, he, uh, to boost his alertness, he accepted an intravenous injection of caffeine, which cannot have done his nerves any good. Okay, so into May 1927, and this is sort of separated month by month. Um, we kind of see all of the different stuff that's going on. So this puts some context into uh, what the newspaper publishing scene was like. Above all, the 1920s was a golden age for newspapers. Newspaper sales in the decade rose by about a fifth to 36 million copies a day, or 1.4 newspapers for every household. New York City alone had 12 daily papers, and almost all other cities worthy of the name had at least two or three. More than this, in many cities readers could now get the news from a new, revolutionary type of publication that completely changed people's expectations of what daily news should be, the tabloid. The tabloids focus on crime, sport and celebrity gossip, and in doing so gave all three an importance considerably beyond any they had enjoyed before. A study in 1927 showed that tabloids devoted between a quarter and a third of their space to crime reports, up to ten times more than the series papers did. We learned about Charles Lindbergh. Um, he had a curiously stunted sense of humour and loved practical jokes that veered dangerously close to cruelty. Once on a hot day he filled a friend's water jug with kerosene and mirthfully stood by as his friend took a mighty swig. The friend ended up in hospital. His principal claim to fame was that he had successfully parachuted out of more crashing planes than anyone else alive, as far as could be told. He had made four emergency parachute jumps, one from just 350 feet, and had crash landed a fifth plane in a Minnesota bog, but clambered out unhurt. And we learn about Charles Lindbergh a lot more. Uh, Lim both his parents were almost wholly incapable of showing affection. Lindbergh and his mother never hugged. At bedtime, they shook hands. As both boy and man, Charles signed letters to his father, sincerely C.A. Lindbergh, as if corresponding with his bank manager. Charles was a shy, rather dreamy boy. He made so little impression on Little Falls that when journalists descended on the town in 1927, looking for anecdotes from his boyhood, none of his ex-schoolmates could think of any. 
Lindbergh himself in adulthood said that he had no memories at all of his daily life as a youngster. In his first autobiographical effort called We, he gave just 18 lines to his childhood. And when he uh, decided to fly the Spirit of St. Louis, so he tried to fly from New York to Paris. Um, to maximise mileage, every ounce of unnecessary weight was discarded. Lindbergh took nothing he didn't need. He reportedly even trimmed the white margins off his maps. Most people couldn't recall a time like it. For months on end, across much of the country, it rained steadily, sometimes in volumes not before seen. Southern Illinois received over two feet of rain in three months. Part of, Al part of Arkansas had well over three. Rivers almost beyond counting, the San Jacinto in California, the Calamath, Willamette and Nupqua in Oregon, the Snake, Payette and Boise in Idaho, the Colorado in Colorado, the Neosho and Verdigree in Kansas, the Wachita and San Francis in Arkansas, the Tennessee and Cumberland in the south, the Connecticut in New England, overran their banks. Between the late summer of 1926 and the following spring, enough precipitation fell on the 48 United States by one calculation to make a cube of water 250 miles across on each side. That was a lot of water and it was only just the beginning. We learn uh, how, how affluent it was at the time. To a foreign visitor arriving in America for the first time in 1927, the most striking thing was how staggeringly well off it was. Americans were the most comfortable people in the world. American homes shone with sleek appliances and consumer durables, refrigerators, radios, telephones, electric fans, electric razors that would not become standard in other countries for a generation or more. Of the nation's 26.8 million households, 11 million had a phonograph, 10 million had a car, 17.5 million had a telephone. Every year, America added more new phones, 781,000 in 1926, than Britain possessed in total. 42% of all that was produced in the world was produced in the United States. America made 80% of the world's movies and 85% of its cars. Kansas alone had more cars than France. At a time when gold reserves were the basic marker of national wealth, America held half the world's supply, or as much as all the rest of the world put together. No country in history had ever been this well off and it was getting wealthier daily at a pace that was positively dizzying. The stock market, already booming, would rise by a third in 1927 in what Herbert Hoover would later call an orgy of mad speculation. But in the spring and summer of 1927, neither he nor anyone else was worried yet. New York had more saloons now than it had had before Prohibition, and drinking remained so transparently prevalent that the mayor of a Berlin on a visit reportedly asked Mayor Jimmy Walker when Prohibition was to begin. The Metropolitan Life Insurance Company reported in 1927 that more people were dying of alcohol-related causes now than at any time before Prohibition was introduced. Part of that was because the government itself was poisoning the alcohol. We get President Coolidge announced that 11th of June would be Lindbergh Day in America, the highest tribute ever paid to a private citizen by the nation. And that's my birthday. And we get this, more than 3.5 million letters were sent to Lindbergh, primarily from females it was noted, along with 15,000 parcels containing gifts and mementos. Many of his correspondence included return postage, about $100,000 worth altogether it was estimated, in the patently deluded hope that he would find time to reply. Western Union received so many messages that it had to assign 38 employees full time to manage them all. One message from Minneapolis contained 15,000 words of text, 17,000 signatures, and stretched 520 feet when unfurled. For the less imaginative, Western Union offered 20 pre-written forms of congratulatory message that people could choose from. Thousands did. So we get this, um, Babe Ruth uh, chatted to a pretty waitress named Helen Woodford. One day, if Ruth's own account is to believe, he said to her, how about you and me getting married, huh? After a few minutes reflection, she accepted and they were wed in the summer of 1914. Ruth was 19, she possibly no more than 15. It was not a hugely successful pairing. In his autobiography, Ruth got her name wrong, wow. And we learn about how baseball was a lot rougher back in the day. Games were often a good deal wilder too. Fights were common and sometimes involved fans as well as players. In 1924, a punch up between Ruth and his great rival Ty Cobb in Detroit not only cleared both benches but caused the riot in the stands. Seats were ripped out and thrown on the field and at least a thousand spectators invaded the playing area. The game had to be abandoned. Players also didn't hesitate to go into the stands after fans who heckled them beyond forbearance. Ruth in 1920 vaulted into the stands to confront a man who had called him a big piece of cheese, then retreated smartly when the man pulled a knife on him. Ty Cobb once went for a spectator who had been riding him all afternoon and beat the man severely. When fans shouted at Cobb that the man was a war veteran who had no hands, Cobb cried, I don't care if he has no feet, and kept pummeling until police arrived and pulled him off. Cobb was suspended for 10 days for that. Ruth once punched an umpire in the jaw in an argument. He was fined $100 and suspended for 10 days too, and was very lucky to get away with that. And here we learn some more of the effects of prohibition. 
It brought an entirely new level of danger to American life. The national murder rate went up by almost a third after Prohibition was introduced. Being a Prohibition agent was dangerous. In the first two and a half years of Prohibition, 30 agents were killed on the job. But just being in the vicinity of agents was often dangerous too, for they frequently proved to be trigger happy. In Chicago alone, Prohibition agents gunned down 23 innocent civilians in just over a decade. And we learn about Calvin Coolidge, who was a man of few words. An oft-told story, which has never been verified, is that a woman sitting next to him at dinner gushed, Mr. President, my friend bet me that I wouldn't be able to get you to say three words tonight. You lose, the president supposedly responded. And we learn about a guy called Strong who became the head of the New York Federal Reserve Bank when it was founded. His personal life, alas, did not achieve a parallel happiness. His wife, who suffered from chronic depression, killed herself in 1905, leaving him with four young children, one of whom died of scarlet fever the following year. Two years later, Strong remarried, but that marriage was not a success either. His second wife left him in 1916 and moved to California with two further children he had had with her. At the same time, he was diagnosed with tuberculosis and needed to spend extended periods convalescing in the clear era of Colorado. While there, he formed a relationship with a young woman, a fellow sufferer of TB, who killed herself horribly by drinking boot polish. This was not a man for whom life was a succession of joyous events. And we get a reference to the coining of the phrase, every day in every way I'm getting better and better, which I know from the song Beautiful Boy, or Darling Boy, or whatever it's called, by John Lennon. There was a baseball player called Urban Shocker, which is a great name. He was actually Urban Jacques Shocker, to a French Canadian family, but Urban Shocker is a cooler name. We learn about Lou Gehrig. He went to uh, university. It says, not the most outstanding of scholars, Gehrig, flend Gehrig flunked introductory German, even though it's his first tongue. That is impressive. That must be hard to do. And uh, we learn about Charles Lindbergh's book, We, his autobiography. Uh, and it wasn't very good. As one reviewer dryly observed, as an author, Lindbergh is the world's foremost aviator. But in all fairness, he did write 40,000 words in three weeks. We learn about the Model T. Um, the Ford Model T. It inspired great affection. It was a source of many loving jokes. In one, a farmer whose tin house roof had been mangled in a tornado sent it to the Ford factory hoping they could advise him how to restore it. The message came back, your car is one of the worst wrecks we have ever seen, but we should be able to fix it. For all its faults, the Model T was practically indestructible, easily repaired, strong enough to pull itself through mud and snow, and built high enough to clear ruts at a time when most rural roads were unpaved. It was also admirably adaptable. Many farmers modified their Model Ts to plough fields, saw lumber, pump water, bore holes, or otherwise perform useful tasks. And I love this. Um, the sociologists Robert and Helen Lind in their classic study of Middle America, Middletown, published in 1929, found to their surprise that more people in the anonymous town of the title, which in fact was Muncie, Indiana, had cars than bathtubs. Asked why, one woman replied simply, because we can't go to town in a bathtub. And we learn that... Um, Henry Ford was obsessed with soy, and this is kind of forward thinking, because this is, if you think about soy, forms a lot of like vegan and vegetarian foods now. Um, remarkably, while this was happening, Henry Ford increasingly occupied himself with other, less urgent matters. He pursued a fixation with finding industrial uses for agricultural products. He was particularly taken with what he saw as the infinite adaptability of the soybean. He wore suits woven from soy fibres and built experimental cars made almost exclusively with soy plastics and other materials. The car never went into production because it never could be made not to stink. He fed guests dinners that consisted primarily of soybean products. Pineapple rings with soybean cheese, soybean bread with soybean butter, apple pie with soy crust, roasted soybean coffee and soy milk ice cream, in the words of his biographer, Greg Grandin. Ford so admired the head of his soybean research division, Edsel Ruderman, that he named his only child after him. Shame that Edsel was such a disappointment to Ford, even though Edsel was a good lad. It's just Ford was a not very nice father. And this is crazy. Um, the return home of two million job-seeking soldiers and the simultaneous dismantling of the wartime economy gave America a severe recession. Racial tensions erupted into riots in two dozen cities where blacks had moved in search of better jobs. In Chicago, where the black population had doubled in a decade, a black youth who fell asleep on a raft on Lake Michigan and drifted onto a white beach was stoned to death by a white crowd, provoking two weeks of bitter rioting in which 38 people were killed and whole neighborhoods raised. And we learned about some bombs that were sent out, but they were never delivered because they were posted and, and they had insufficient postage. And this is this is awful. Three years earlier, on the last day of June 1924, Coolidge's two sons, John and Calvin Jr., had a game of tennis on a White House court. Calvin Jr. wore sneakers without socks and developed a blister which became infected. Within a day or so, he was running a high fever and was drifting in and out of delirium. On the 3rd of July, the day before his father's birthday, he was hurriedly admitted to Walter Reed General Hospital. And eventually he died. Okay, and then we learn why Charles Lindbergh maybe wasn't such a hero after all, with a quote like this from September. A few Jews add strength and character to a country. Too many create chaos, and we are getting too many. And there is some um, 
examples of racism that I better not read out because they include racial slurs. But yes, One Summer America 1927 by Bill Bryson. Fascinating read. There's bits I enjoyed more than others. For example, I'm not a huge fan of baseball, so all of that stuff wasn't too interesting. But I think it was important, and it, it was clearly an important year in American history. And it was interesting reading it in 2023, so we're nearly 100 years later, and seeing how much the events of just that one summer are still very important today, you know? Uh, I think you will enjoy this if you're interested in, like, narrative non-fiction and stuff. And, uh, yeah, I gave One Summer American 1927 by Bill Bryson a 4 out of 5. So there we have it, that's what I made of One Summer, American 1927 by Bill Bryson. As always, don't forget to let me know in the comments what you thought of this book, if you read it. Hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video, hit that subscribe button for more, and I'll see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot. Bye bye